I'm back again. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the, the solar uh, experiment on SME. And that, uh, actually, this maybe started a little bit earlier, but that's what's flourished into the very large solar radiance program that LAST conducts today. Uh, I gave a public lecture last night and I commented, and I hope nobody quotes me because I don't know that it's true, but I believe that there's more solar physicists, solar scientists in Boulder, per capita certainly, than anywhere in the world. And you probably all heard the NSO, the National Solar Observatory, is now coming to the university. And HAO up at NCAR, Space Environment Lab at NOAA, the group at last, uh, group, uh, people within the university, lots and lots of solar physics here. So uh, if you live in Boulder, you have lots of opportunities to hear public lectures about the sun. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go way back. Now, you know, this isn't 30 years ago. This is uh, 60 plus years ago. This is a V2, uh, probably down at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico, uh, later ago from White Sands. But we, after the war, the United States picked up a lot of these. Uh, vehicles and they started to launch them and they were looking for payloads for them. And so this is what an early laboratory at uh, the University in Aerospace looked like. It was out on the lawn. No. We think there's a real reason that they were outside uh, doing some testing of this instrument, but you can tell by the Army truck in the back that uh, this, this was a very different time at the University. Uh, and so the upper air lab uh, in the physics department started building instruments and flying them on either the V2 or the Araby that was being developed at that time. Now this is uh, probably an Araby, I guess, but this, this shows the biaxial pointing control. And this was also a, uh, a device developed within the upper air lab. It's a two-axis control that allows you to go up and on this uh, madly spinning uh, rocket somehow uh, point an instrument at the sun or, or at an astronomical target. And the university became very, very uh, good at making these and very, very popular. And uh, pretty soon they were making these for everybody. Harvard, you name it, anybody that wanted to fly something got a biaxial pointing control. And at some point, and this isn't really maybe the way the history goes, but at some point the university spun them off, the group that was making this, and that became all of us. And so here it is is a connection and why Ball Brothers is, uh, very, has very, very tight connections to last and the university. And then this is uh, Fred Wilshusen, uh, who I kind of think of as Mr. Rocket at last. He, uh, uh, all of the rockets, uh, I'm sure through the late 50s, all through the 60s, uh, Fred was there. And many of us spent a lot of time in the field with Fred. That was, uh, that was great. Uh, Lucille, just for your information, is. Fred's wife's name. So this is something from a paper that Tom Woods write, wrote, uh, and this is supposedly Lyman Alpha going back to the uh, late 1940s. Now there were no measurements of Lyman Alpha back there. There are some measurements of Lyman Alpha, the ones that we make from, as a matter of fact, I would say from 1972 forward. So from about here, we started making measurements. But what Tom did in a very clever way is took the real measurements and connected those to 10.7 centimeter, which is a radio emission. And by doing that, he, he made this, uh, this model that carries line and alpha back that far. The reason it doesn't go back any further is that's about when they started making these radio flux measurements of the sun. So that's a record. And that just, gives, that just puts the sun into, uh, into a time frame for us where you can clearly see the 11 year solar cycle. Uh, and that's the period that SME operated, so from 1981 to 89. And so you see SME got up when the sun was very, very active. We followed the sun down to solar minimum, through solar minimum in 86 and back up to solar maximum. And for those of you not familiar, whenever you see these solar things, a lot of people look at it and say, well, that's, that's poor data, you know, all that uh, noise and bumps and wiggles, and it's just really noisy. But, but that's really the sun. It really, it, it's not even noise, that's the, the 27 rotation period of the sun as it's turning more or less like a searchlight and just sending a lot of flux our way or uh, 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 
15 days later, a lot less loss. And I just put on here IGY. Uh, IGY, I don't know a lot about it. I guess I was in sixth grade or there, so that I was working on IGY. But there were many people at the university, uh, Julie London, who I'll talk about, and then it was uh, well tied up with that. Marcel Nicolet, who was in Belgium, was the secretary of IGY. Uh, and these are all people in the radiation science commission who came here during SME. Well, Julie was always here, but anyway, I just put it on there as a time frame. Uh, when I came here in 72, uh, somehow I got this picture of the directory of the Duane Last Science Building. Uh, Carolyn Hines back here who knows all the people at Last now. The last directory would cover, I think, the whole front wall here. I don't know, but this is who we had then. Now, this doesn't include the people at 55th Street. Uh, and, and I'm sorry that this is out of focus. Um, but I'll tell you some of these. Up at the top it says Charles Barth, who's the director. Bill Rents was the educational director. And then there's Fred Wilshus, who was the operations director. Uh, of the, the people, these are the research people. Uh, George Lawrence is here with us today. Charlie Ward, I, I think, will not be here. But he, I saw him just a few days ago. Uh, I'm on here. I, I just showed up. Uh, Ian Stewart and Gary Thomas are here. And I'm probably missing somebody up there in the science group because most, but most of these people have, have moved on. Uh, Marty Cunningham was, uh, I think, our financial person. Uh, anyway, I'm only going to mention people here that are here today. Gail Anderson, uh, I saw Gail last night. She's unable to be here today, but she was working with uh, Julie London and Charles Barth on some early ozone data. Uh, let me go down this. Uh, Brianna Osman, I know, is around. That's uh, Alan Shushu's. Uh, wife, um, I'm going to miss some. Karen Simmons, uh, saw her working last late last night packing her boxes and uh, trying to get ready to move. Uh, Ken Kelly, we're very, very pleased that Ken has joined us this morning. Uh, Dave Stern is not here, but Dave Stern, the uh, inventor of IDL, was uh, working away on the third floor. Uh, Elaine Hansen and uh, Bill Evans, uh, they were up on the third floor. Uh, and let me see, I think that's Don Anderson, and is Don here? Well, Don had signed up, and so maybe he'll show up. Uh, Don was a very, very good office mate, because I noticed on this that he and I shared offices, and yet I don't even remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think he was, he was, he was very well behaved. But anyway, I came uh, from Johns Hopkins University. I had done my thesis on a uh, rocket experiment uh, measuring the ultraviolet emissions from Venus. And it was very, very different in those days. What you got is a kind of a photo uh, paper that came out of a telemetry station. And you could run it at very high speeds. And these were FM FM systems. There was no digital data coming down. So I took home a roll of paper, you know, maybe uh, eight inches in diameter. And what I what first had to do was go through this and count all the little clips. But the thing is, with the Venus spectrum, you could count the individual photons, and that's how you did it. And of course, this was only a 14-inch telescope on a rocket. Venus is very dim. But anyway, I came here to work on Dr. Bruner's also eight experiment, and the, the thing that I was charged to do was to calibrate, work on the calibration of that. So this is the first rocket that I had in 1972, and I must say, I was amazed because Boy, the photons you get from the sun, they really beat what you get from Venus. <laughs> you would have to work hard not to saturate your instrument. So that was nice. And I'm going to put this back on the table. This is not a last built instrument. And Laura's is this the one that flew on that, but this is the vintage, and this is the type of instrument. So this is an 8 meter Ebert Fasti spectrometer, not a dual channel one like the others, single channel. But this is the instrument. The way you do this, you just point it directly at the sun, and there's a little motor that scans the grating, and you build up the spectrum of the sun. The reason we were doing this in '72 is Bill Fasti, uh, who George Mount, um, George mentioned, uh, at Hopkins had a very large Hebert spat, Fasti spectrometer, of course, on Apollo 17. So it was at the moon. This is the last. Apollo to go to the moon. He had an experiment on the orbiter. They were trying to measure water vapor and other uh, constituents. And they needed measurements of the sun. And so that's why uh, I was flying this rocket. 
it, this instrument comes from Ray Instrument Shop. And if you were at Hopkins, you didn't have the wonderful machine shop that uh, last had. You had a couple of machinists, wonderful machinists, but they could do some things. But your instruments were made by Rayleigh Machine Shop. Uh, Rayleigh, I think they originally started making cams for merry-go-rounds and things, but uh, then they got down into miniaturized instruments and did very well. So this is the rocket, and this is a picture. This is Bill Fasty and this. Oh, wrong button. I'm sorry. That's Bill Fasty, and this is Charles Bard. And I don't. They worked a lot together. Uh, they were they were very close friends. Uh, and I know at this time they were down in Houston because I was on the phone with them. Uh, and I, but I don't think this is a picture of them in Houston. But anyway, that that's they used to hop off quite a bit together, and uh, so I imagine that that was them down in Houston. So Bill was very pleased. The rocket worked very well. Uh, this is my first encounter with the sun. I'm watching a chart recorder. These are digital data now. And this is what the spectrum of the sun looks like. It's just peeling out of this instrument. This is probably about the 30th scan from flying out to basically here out to about 200 nanometers. And I'm watching it, and I'm watching it. They're just going one after another. And then all of a sudden I get this one where they, you know, we're going through and then boom, we lose it and then boom, we pick it up again. And I really thought that somehow we were at the end of the flight, we were losing track of the sun, so we got off the sun and back on the sun. And then lo and behold, the next factor just has this one strong line, nothing, and then another little bit. So anyway, I, I left the rocket, I, I knew we were very successful, but I, I just assumed at the end we were missing things. Well, when I got home and I'm looking at the data, uh, I realized that what this was is a rocket is now coming down into the atmosphere, and this is atmosphere absorption. And anyway, at this time, you know, I've been here six months or so, I met Julie London. And uh, Julie was very excited about these data. He didn't mind or care about calibrating the moon. He said, you know, this is hot stuff. This is what we need for ozone in the atmosphere. And so this is really my first uh, encounter in understanding ozone. The reason that this is all absorbed is by O2 as a rocket comes down below 100 kilometers. But what, was, what is interesting is Lyman Alpha is probably almost unattenuated down below 80 kilometers. And this is just by this unique quirk that there's a, almost a hole in the ozone cross-section that lets Lyman Alpha down very far. Very important because Lyman Alpha is super powerful and so it's going, to, it's going to start attacking water vapor primarily, probably down in those out. Anyway, then Julie London became a very close cohort of mine. And uh, Julie, of course, passed away a uh, year and a half ago or so now. But, uh, uh, he was involved in all the experiments from this time forward. And he, took, he started teaching me about the Chapman reactions. Uh, Sidney Chapman was up at uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, but he used to come to Boulder all the time. Uh, most summers, I think, I never met him. He died uh, long before I got here. But these are the Chapman reactions written down probably in the 1930s, and they talk about ozone. The reason I'm going to show well, too many buttons here. Uh, so this says if you, if you have molecular oxygen in the atmosphere, and if you hit it with soap, sunlight with energy, or wavelength below about 240 nanometers, it dissociates, and that produces ozone. This, this isn't my talk, this is for other people today. But then that, uh, the ozone, if you hit it with photons at a little bit longer wavelength, uh, you break up the ozone. So then this is a loss of ozone in the atmosphere. Um, remember I talked about the 1.27 micron emission that comes from this O2, this is in an excited state. This reaction here is what is, uh, sped up by catalysts in the atmosphere, and that's why back at this time, in the late 70s, uh, the concern about freons and uh, chlorine in the atmosphere, all of that was a catalyst is forming ozone. But anyway, that's why this is important, and probably these two equations kind of epitomize uh, the science of SME. So here we are, uh, I've shown this before, here's the ascending node, you've got to get this just right, but once we got on a delta vehicle, it put us just into the right orbit. And if you get that orbit, the inclination, the altitude just right, you will process in one degree a day. And of course, as the Earth moves around the sun at one degree a day, that means you'll stay set in constant orbital time. Not completely true, because this little spacecraft uh, is fairly inexpensive. It doesn't have any gas. It can't adjust the altitude. 
it's not magnetic torquing, and you're going to hear about that uh, tomorrow primarily. But magnetic torquing can, number one, it can speed up the uh, spin rate of the spacecraft because we want to spin at uh, five revolutions per minute. And number two, it can change the axis of rotation a little bit in the orbit, but it can't really move the orbit. And so during the mission, the orbit is going to drop in altitude. The uh, precession is going to change in time. It's not going to precess at the same rate. And pretty soon, we're going to get out of that 3, uh, 3 pf orbit. Now, so they say, OK, uh, put a solar instrument on there. Well, this will be eight meter. The way you do this is you point it directly at the sun. So I said, that's good. That's great. We'll put a solar instrument on there. I know just how to do that. And we'll point the spacecraft at the sun. And I'm sure Charlie Barr said, no, we're not going to do that. This is a little spinning spacecraft. It doesn't point anywhere. And then I said, OK, well, OK, the sun will be about 45 degrees off the spin axis. If I, but it won't stay there if I can have a platform. And if I can move that up and down so it's just right, every time I come through the sun, we'll get the sun. And uh, they said, no platforms. Uh, nothing's going to move on this spacecraft. But you can just sit on there and, you know, and do the best you can. So the instrument that we came up with uh, is a little dual channel lever fastened spectrometer, which rolls off my tongue now. <laughs> but because of this angular thing, we had to make scattering screens. So if you imagine putting a piece of white paper out in sunlight, the sun will shine on it, and then you could point your spectrometer at that, and you could get the light off. That would work for the white light. Uh, we needed very special scattering screens, and so this is a quartz plate. Uh, for the longer wavelengths, uh, the light, uh, the back side of that plate is roughed up, so it becomes a diffusive surface, and it scatters light into the instrument. For the shorter wavelengths, that won't work. Uh, and so we had a special uh, plate that had these ultrasonically machined little dimples in it, and they were, they became little mirrors. The thing looked somewhat like a fly's eye or something, and it would be all these little scattering centers. And Kim Kelly is here. Uh, he had a lot to do with the development of those uh, scattering screens. But anyway, so now, whenever the, the, imagine that the sun is in the plane of that picture, you snap a picture, or you, you take a wavelength from it, you take one sample. Out of the thing, and then it rotates around and you get another sample. But this angle, if I can draw it carefully from here, the sun might be out here, the sun might be out here, depending upon how we're processing in the orbit and how the people that guide the spacecraft have it lined up. So that was going to be difficult. That's called the volumetric correction to how you scatter off that screen. We spent a lot of time in the lab calibrating that. That was going to make this a complicated experiment because you're going to have to keep backing out just what that angle was. And now, and then, so this is what you do. Uh, each rotation, you take a sample, advance the wavelength drive, take a sample, and this is the spectrum of the sun that we obtained with SME. Um, starting again down here at light and alpha, going all the way through the region that dissociates O2, creating ozone in the atmosphere, all the way through that dissociates ozone as a loss of uh, ozone in the atmosphere. And here's the spacecraft. Uh, again, this is over at Ball Brothers. This is the solar pan or the panel on it, and the solar array is on the back side of that, so the sun shines there. This is a set of instruments. This is really the, the little painting I showed. This is what it looks like in real life. I had to cut a tooth out of this uh, solar panel, or out of, pan, out of the panel, and that's sort of solar instrument to look back at the sun. Uh, also, though, there are limb sensors on there that are triggering when we're hitting the limb, and those have to look out both sides of the spacecraft so they're looking out. But that's, uh, that's why we have that cut in there. Uh, am I out of time? I got it. All right, here, so here's the... Uh, Here's the orbit, and then what we found, though, is as soon as it got up there, uh, the operations people uh, said this spacecraft is getting very cold. And indeed, the spacecraft did get very cold when we had to scramble. Uh, I remember Charles Barth and Tom Sparn working on this, torquing it. But you could torque it, and you could torque it around so the sun came quite a bit on the backside. And it warmed up enough so we could run the mission. And they said, uh, we're going to have to hold it there throughout the mission. We're going to hold it at this bay angle, this angle of the sun. So that thing I just talked about, how my life was going to be difficult, all of a sudden it became very easy. 
all the wind instruments people, boy, they have frowns on their face because <laughs> now instead of coming straight down through the limb making your measurement, you might be kind of doing a slice and it might get better and it might get worse. So anyway, that made my life, and that's why I call this the SME frozen orientation. Yet the instrument operated, and this is the type of signal we get. This is at nine and alpha. Uh, throughout the mission, again, very active sun, going very quiet sun. Not going too fast. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's that's the time series, and we got that in all wavelengths. So here's SME. The point here is just before the launch of SME, we proposed an instrument for uh, URs. Bill Fast had been telling me all the time, well, you have to make an instrument that looks at the sun and then at night looks at stars. And uh, so I was trying to do that, and I proposed that to the Solar Maximum Mission. It was a big thing with big solar instruments, and I said, you mind if we point at the stars? And they said, uh, you're not going to do that. You're not coming on our spacecraft. So we didn't get on. But when we proposed it for URs, uh, we got on. Now, I want to mention now Tom Sparn. Tom Sparn, also from JHU. Uh, he came in 87. Uh, and uh, has, has been with the program ever since. And one of the amazing things I think Tom did is the San Marcos satellite, which is a European satellite, and Gerhard Schmidt is the PI. They launched the satellite. We saw or got contacted him that summer, and he was uh, in trouble because the satellite, number one, wasn't going to last very long, and number two, it didn't have a good calibration. Uh, I told this to Tom. We had some parts in a box of an EUV spectrometer, and George Lawrence always could find an extra fluid time detector, built the instrument, launched it in October. So that thing from beginning to end, concept to end, was I would guess maybe four months or so. And it was an amazing thing. The instrument worked very, very well. Uh, Tom became part of the San Marco team, and he then started to develop an EUV program, so much shorter wavelengths than we were doing. And uh, you'll see that that EUV carries on. Um, and here, this is Tom, Rick Conner, and Greg uh, Upper. And I'm not sure who that is, but that's the, the launch of that, that rocket. Then we got the instrument on URs. I won't talk a lot about this, but finally we got the instrument. You could look at the sun, look at stars with the same instrument. And we operated URs from 1991 until 2005. Big, broad arrow. EOS we proposed in 1988 and not accepted. Why is it broad like that? Is it that important? No. It's because Tom Sparn probably wrote, I don't know, 13, 14 proposals during that time. All we did with EOS is keep studying and trying to find a way to get that instrument up. And that's why that's uh, broad like that. I'll tell you about uh, UR Schultz's in the coffee breaks. This is a schematic of it, but again, this is the instrument that can cover eight orders of magnitude difference in the brightness of a target, look at the sun, look at stars. I want to put this up because this is something Tom Woods gave me the other day, and these are data that he's just putting together for the AGU meeting in uh, December. And this compares the solar cycle variability we saw with SME with the solar cycle variability we saw with URs. And uh, for those of us who know this is amazingly good agreement and uh, what, what that shows is we're still working with the SME data. We're still doing things with it. It's an extremely valuable data set. Uh, this is a URs instrument we extended, and now we go all the way from Lyman Alpha all the way out through the visible. But indeed, this visible part wasn't working real well because the difference in magnitude between the sun and the stars isn't as great as it is in shorter wavelengths, and the variability of the sun is much less. So we got measurements, but we really weren't really connecting them to the stars. And so back at that time, Tom Sparn was finally getting to where maybe we would be a free flyer if the spacecraft had finally became sourced. Uh, George Mount said he would come over and work for about a year to develop a visible light spectrometer, against what we call SIM. That's working very, very well. Jerry Carter is now the one that uh, oversees that. <coughs> George Lawrence uh, agreed that uh, the total solar range could be done in a much better way, and he developed this instrument, and this now is the gold standard for TSI measurements. It's re revamped the whole scale for the total solar range coming into the Earth. SIM is working well. A second generation source, well, I, I must mention Greg Kopp is uh, the person that now uh, uh, runs that. Tom Woods had an EUV, but it, it just shows you the spectral coverage. Again, Tim, the total radius monitor, all the radiation, the solstice covers all of this, and then Tom had 
an instrument on the time spacecraft. So during this time period, we essentially cover the entire spectral range. And then this just shows that. I, I think I showed this last night. This shows all the rockets. George Mount came during the SME period. I was flying this little type of spectrometer on, on a coronal experiment that I was conducting. And then George got another smaller rocket, a Taurus Orion. And he was flying those in between. So these things were going back and forth to the field continually. I, I think I showed this. No, no, no. I'm going to the next one. Did this? A long, long time. George, I'm almost finished. This just then shows that fleet of spacecraft. Uh, all the way up to time that was turned off earlier this year. Uh, the source, those are continuing off the paper. I retired in 05, and that's why I refused to make plots and go wrong. <laughs> I gave this talk last night, and, uh, and I told Tom, I'm sorry, he, he launched SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, the EVE experiment on that last year. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of that, but I got up this morning and got on the web. And uh, so this is SDO, and this is the EVE instrument there. So right now we have source operating uh, at SDO. The lab is building instruments for uh, GOES. Uh, I'm sorry, what's the name of the thesis? What, what spacecraft? OK, Tom is doing. Right now, he's writing another proposal to try to get that instrument on. But anyway, that's all I'm going to say. I mean, what you can see is how what we did with SME that really set the, set the stage for all the iterations. Thanks. Thank you.